Chapter Fifteen of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. So smile the heavens upon this holy act, that after hours with sorrow chide us not. Shakespeare. It is proper that the course of the narrative should be stayed, while we revert to those causes which have brought in their train of consequences the singular contest just related. The interruption must necessarily be as brief as we hope it may prove satisfactory to that class of readers who require that no gap should be left by those who assume the office of historians for their own fertile imaginations to fill. Among the troops sent by the government of the United States to take possession of its newly acquired territory in the West was a detachment led by a young soldier who has become so busy an actor in the scenes of our legend. The mild and indolent descendants of the ancient colonists received their new compatriots without distrust, well knowing that the transfer raised them from the condition of subjects to the more enviable distinction of citizens in a government of laws. The new rulers exercised their functions with discretion, and wielded their delegated authority without offense. In such a novel intermixture, however, of men born and nurtured in freedom, and the compliant minions of absolute power, the Catholic and the Protestant, the active and the indolent, some little time was necessary to blend the discrepant elements of society. In attaining so desirable an end, woman was made to perform her accustomed and grateful office. The barriers of prejudice and religion were broken through by the irresistible power of the master passion, and family unions, ere long, began to cement the political tie which had made a forced conjunction between people so opposite in their habits, their educations, and their opinions. Middleton was among the first of the new possessors of the soil, who became captive to the charms of a Louisiana lady. In the immediate vicinity of the post he had been directed to occupy, dwelt the chief of one of those ancient colonial families which had been content to slumber for ages among the ease, indolence, and wealth of the Spanish provinces. He was an officer of the crown, and had been induced to remove from the Floridas among the French of the adjoining province, by a rich succession of which he has become the inheritor. The name of Don Augustin de Certavales was scarcely known beyond the limits of the little town in which he resided, though he found a secret pleasure himself in pointing it out, in large scrolls of musty documents, to an only child, as enrolled among the former heroes and grandees of old and of new Spain. This fact, so important to himself, and of so little moment to anybody else, was the principal reason that while his more vivacious Gallic neighbors were not slow to open a frank communion with their visitors, he chose to keep aloof, seemingly content with the society of his daughter, who was a girl just emerging from the condition of childhood into that of a woman. The curiosity of the youthful Inez, however, was not so inactive. She had not heard the martial music of the garrison, melting on the evening air, nor seen the strange banner which fluttered over the heights that rose at no great distance from her father's extensive grounds, without experiencing some of those secret impulses which are thought to distinguish the sex. Natural timidity, and that retiring and perhaps peculiar lassitude which forms the very groundwork of female fascination in the tropical provinces of Spain, held her in their seemingly indissoluble bonds, and it is more than probable that had not an accident occurred in which Middleton was of some personal service to her father, so long a time would have elapsed before they met that another direction might have been given to the wishes of one who was just of an age to be alive to all the power of youth and beauty. Providence, or, if that imposing word is too just to be classical, fate had otherwise decreed. The haughty and reserved Don Augustine was by far too observant of the forms of that station, on which he so much valued himself to forget the duties of a gentleman. Gratitude, for the kindness of Middleton, induced him to open his doors to the officers of the garrison, and to admit of a guarded but polite intercourse. Reserve gradually gave way before the propriety and candor of their spirited young leader, and it was not long ere the influent planter rejoiced as much as his daughter whenever the well-known signal at the gate announced one of these agreeable visits from the commander of the post. 
It is unnecessary to dwell on the impression which the charms of Inez produced on the soldier, or to delay the tale, in order to write a wire-down account of the progressive influence that elegance of deportment, manly beauty, and undivided assiduity and intelligence were likely to produce on the sensitive mind of a romantic, warm-hearted, and secluded girl of sixteen. It is sufficient for our purpose to say that they loved, that the youth was not backward to declare his feelings, that he prevailed with some facility over the scruples of the maiden, and with no little difficulty over the objections of her father, and that before the province of Louisiana had been six months in the possession of the states, the officer of the latter was the affianced husband of the richest heiress on the banks of the Mississippi. Although we have presumed the reader to be acquainted with the manner in which such results are commonly attained, it is not to be supposed that the triumph of Middleton, either over the prejudices of the father or over those of the daughter, was achieved without difficulty. Religion formed a stubborn and nearly irremovable obstacle with both. The devoted man patiently submitted to a formidable essay Father Ignatius was deputed to make in order to convert him to the true faith. The effort on the part of the worthy priest was systematic, vigorous, and long-sustained. A dozen times it was at those moments when glimpses of the light, sylph-like, from Inez flitted like some fairy being past the scene of their conferences. The good father fancied he was on the eve of a glorious triumph over infidelity, but all his hopes were frustrated by some unlooked-for opposition on the part of the subject of his pious labors. So long as the assault on his faith was distant and feeble, Middleton, who was no great proficient in polemics, submitted to its effects with the patience and humility of a martyr. But the moment the good father, who felt such concern in his future happiness, was tempted to improve his vantage ground by calling in the aid of some of the peculiar subtilities of his own creed, the young man was too good a soldier not to make head against the hot attack. He came to the contest, it is true, with no weapons more formidable than common sense, and some little knowledge of the habits of his country as contrasted with that of his adversary. But with these home-bred implements he never failed to repulse the father with something of the power with which a nervous cudgel player would deal with a skilful master of the rapier, setting at naught his passados by the direct and unanswerable arguments of a broken head and a shivered weapon. Before the controversy was terminated, an inroad of Protestants had come to aid the soldier. The reckless freedom of such among them, as thought only of this life, and the consistent and tempered piety of others, caused the honest priest to look about him in concern. The influence of example on one hand, and the contamination of too free an intercourse on the other, began to manifest themselves even in that portion of his own flock, which he had supposed to be too thoroughly folded in spiritual government ever to stray. It was time to turn his thoughts from the offensive, and to prepare his followers to resist the lawless deluge of opinion, which threatened to break down the barriers of their faith. Like a wise commander, who finds he has occupied too much ground for the amount of his force, he began to curtail his outworks. The relics were concealed from profane eyes. His people were admonished not to speak of miracles before a race that not only denied their existence, but who had even the desperate hardihood to challenge their proofs and even the Bible itself was prohibited with terrible denunciations for the triumphant reason that it was liable to be misinterpreted. In the meantime it became necessary to report to Don Augustine the effects his arguments and prayers had produced on the heretical disposition of the young soldier. No man is prone to confess his weakness at the very moment when circumstances demand the utmost efforts of his strength. By a species of pious fraud, for which no doubt the worthy priest found his absolution in the purity of his motives, he declared that, while no positive change was actually wrought in the mind of Middleton, there was every reason to hope the entering wedge of argument had been driven to its head, and that in consequence an opening was left, through which it might rationally be hoped the blessed seeds of a religious fruitification would find their way, especially if the subject was left uninterruptedly to enjoy the advantage of Catholic communion. Don Augustine himself was now seized with the desire of proselyting. Even the soft and amiable Inez thought it would be a glorious consummation of her wishes to be a humble instrument of bringing her lover into the bosom of the true church. 
the offers of Middleton were promptly accepted, and while the father looked forwardly impatiently to the day assigned for the nuptials as to the pledge of his own success, the daughter thought of it with feelings in which the holy emotions of her faith were blended with the softer sensations of her years and situation. The sun rose, the morning of her nuptials, on a day so bright and cloudless that Inez hailed it as a harbinger of future happiness. Father Ignatius performed the offices of the church in a little chapel attached to the estate of Don Augustine. And long ere the sun had begun to fall, Middleton pressed the blushing and timid young Creole to his bosom, his acknowledged and unalienable wife. It had pleased the parties to pass the day of the wedding in retirement, dedicating it solely to the best and purest affections, aloof from the noisy and heartless rejoicings of a compelled festivity. Middleton was returning through the grounds of Don Augustine from a visit of duty to his encampment, at that hour in which the light of the sun begins to melt into the shadows of the evening, when a glimpse of a robe, similar to that in which Inez had accompanied him to the altar, caught his eye through the foliage of a retired arbor. He approached the spot with a delicacy that was rather increased than diminished by the claim she had perhaps given him to intrude on her private moments but the sounds of her soft voice, which was offering up prayers, in which he heard himself named by the dearest of all appellations, overcame his scruples, and induced him to take a position where he might listen without the fear of detection. It was certainly grateful to the feelings of a husband to be able in this manner to lay bare the spotless soul of his wife, and to find out his own image lay enshrined amid its purest and holiest aspirations. His self-esteem was too much flattered not to induce him to overlook the immediate object of the petitioner. While she prayed that she might become the humble instrument of bringing him into the flock of the faithful, she petitioned for forgiveness on her own behalf. If presumption or indifference to the counsel of the church had caused her to set too high a value on her influence, and led her into the dangerous error of hazarding her own soul by espousing a heretic. There was so much of fervent piety mingled with so strong a burst of natural feeling, so much of the woman blended with the angel in her prayers, that Middleton could have forgiven her had she termed him a pagan, for the sweetness and interest with which she petitioned in his favor. The young man waited until his bride arose from her knees, and then he joined her as if entirely ignorant of what had occurred. "'It is getting late, my Inez,' he said and Don Augustine would be apt to reproach you with inattention to your health in being abroad at such an hour. What then am I to do, who am charged with all his authority and twice his love? Be like him in everything, she answered, looking up in his face with tears in her eyes, and speaking with emphasis. In everything imitate my father, Middleton, and I can ask no more of you. Nor for me, Inez. I doubt not that I should be all you can wish, were I to become as good as the worthy and respectable Don Augustine. But you are to make some allowances for the infirmities and habits of a soldier. Now let us go and join this excellent father. Not yet, said his bride, gently extricating herself from the arm that he had thrown around her slight form, while he urged her from the place. I still have another duty to perform, before I can submit so implicitly to your orders, soldier though you are. I promise the worthy Inesella, my faithful nurse, she who, as you heard, has so long been a mother to me, Middleton, I promise her a visit at this hour. It is the last, as she thinks, that she can receive from her own child, and I cannot disappoint her. Go you then to Don Augustine. In one short hour I will rejoin you. Remember, it is but an hour. One hour, repeated Inez, as she kissed her hand to him and then, blushing, ashamed at her own boldness, she darted from the arbor, and was seen for an instant gliding towards the cottage of her nurse, in which at the next moment she disappeared. Middleton returned slowly and thoughtfully to the house, often bending his eyes in the direction in which he had last seen his wife, as if he would fain trace her lovely form in the gloom of the evening, still floating through the vacant space. Don Augustine received him with warmth, and for many minutes his mind was amused by relating to his new kinsman plans for the future. The exclusive old Spaniard listened to his glowing but true account of the prosperity and happiness of those states of which he had been an ignorant neighbor half his life, partly in wonder and partly with that sort of incredulity with which one attends to what he fancies are the exaggerated descriptions of a too partial friendship. 
In this manner the hour for which Enos had conditioned passed away, much sooner than her husband could have thought possible in her absence. At length his looks began to wander to the clock, and then the minutes were counted, as one rolled by after another, and Enos did not appear. The hand had already made half of another circuit around the face of the dial, when Middleton arose and announced his determination to go and offer himself as an escort to the absentee. He found the night dark, and the heavens charged with threatening vapor, which in that climate was the infallible forerunner of a gust. Stimulated no less by the unpropitious aspect of the skies than by his secret uneasiness, he quickened his pace, making long and rapid strides in the direction of the cottage of Inesella. Twenty times he stopped, fancying that he caught glimpses of the fairy form of Inez, tripping across the grounds, on her return to the mansion-house, and, as often, he was obliged to resume his course in disappointment. He reached the gate of the cottage, knocked, opened the door, entered, and even stood in the presence of the aged nurse, without meeting the person of her he sought. She had already left the place, on her return to her father's house. Believing that he must have passed her in the darkness, Middleton retraced his steps to meet with another disappointment. Enos had not been seen. Without communicating his intention to anyone, the bridegroom proceeded with a palpitating heart to the little sequestered harbor, where he had overheard his bride offering up those petitions for his happiness and conversion. Here, too, he was disappointed, and then all was afloat in the painful incertitude of doubt and conjecture. For many hours a secret distrust of the motives of his wife caused Middleton to proceed in the search with delicacy and caution. But as day dawned, without restoring her to the arms of her father or her husband, reserve was thrown aside, and her unaccountable absence was loudly proclaimed. The inquiries after the lost Inez were now direct and open, but they proved equally fruitless. No one had seen her or heard of her from the moment she left the cottage of her nurse. Day succeeded day, and still no tidings rewarded the search that was immediately instituted, until she was finally given over, by most of her relations and friends, as irretrievably lost. An event of so extraordinary a character was not likely to be soon forgotten. It excited speculation, gave rise to an infinity of rumors, and not a few inventions. The prevalent opinion among such of those immigrants who were overrunning the country, as had time, in the multitude of their employments, to think of any foreign concerns, was the simple and direct conclusion that the absent bride was no more nor less than a philo de se. Father Ignatius had many doubts and much secret compunction of conscience, but, like a wise chief, he endeavored to turn the sad event to some account in the impending warfare of faith. Changing his battery, he whispered in the ears of a few of his oldest parishioners that he had been deceived in the state of Middleton's mind, which he was now compelled to believe was completely stranded on the quicksands of heresy. He began to show his relics again, and was even heard to allude once more to the delicate and nearly forgotten subject of modern miracles. In consequence of these demonstrations, on the part of the venerable priest, it came to be whispered among the faithful, and finally it was adopted as part of the parish creed, that Enos had been translated to heaven. Don Augustine had all the feelings of a father, but they were smothered in the lassitude of a creole. Like a spiritual governor, he began to think that they had been wrong in consigning one so pure, so young, so lovely, and above all so pious, to the arms of a heretic. And he was fain to believe that the calamity which had befallen his age was a judgment on his presumption and want of adherence to established forms. It is true that as the whispers of the congregation came to his ears, he found present consolation in their belief. But then nature was too powerful and had too strong a hold of the old man's heart not to give rise to the rebellious thought that the succession of his daughter to the heavenly inheritance was a little premature. But Middleton, the lover, the husband, the bridegroom, Middleton was nearly crushed by the weight of the unexpected and terrible blow, educated himself under the dominion of a simple and rational faith, in which nothing is attempted to be concealed from the believers, he could have no other apprehensions for the faith of Inez than such as grew out of his knowledge of the superstitious opinions she entertained of his own church. It is needless to dwell on the mental tortures that he endured, or all the various surmises, hopes, and disappointments that he was fated to experience in the first few weeks of his misery. 
a jealous distrust of the modus of Inez, and a secret, lingering hope that he should yet find her, had tempered his inquiries, without, however, causing him to abandon them entirely. But time was beginning to deprive him even of the mortifying reflection that he was intentionally, though perhaps temporarily, deserted, and he was gradually yielding to the more painful conviction that she was dead when his hopes were suddenly revived in a new and singular manner. The young commander was slowly and sorrowfully returning from an evening parade of his troops to his own quarters, which stood at some little distance from the place of the encampment and on the same high bluff of land, when his vacant eyes fell on the figure of a man who, by the regulations of the place, was not entitled to be there at that forbidden hour. The stranger was meanly dressed, with every appearance about his person and countenance, of squalid poverty and of the most dissolute habits. Sorrow had softened the military pride of Middleton, and, as he passed the crouching form of the intruder, he said, in tones of great mildness, or rather of kindness, you will be given a night in the guardhouse, friend, should the patrol find you here. There is a dower. Go, and get a better place to sleep in, and something to eat. I will swallow all my food, Captain, without chewing, returned the vagabond with a low exultation of an accomplished villain, as he eagerly seized the silver. Make this Mexican twenty, and I will sell you a secret. Go, go, said the other, with a little of his soldier's severity, returning to his manner. Go, before I order the guard to seize you. Well, go, I will. But if I do go, Captain, I shall take my knowledge with me, and then you may live a widower betwitched till the tattoo of life is beat off. What mean you, fellow? exclaimed Middleton, turning quickly towards the wretch, who was already dragging his diseased limbs from the place. I mean to have the value of this dollar in Spanish brandy, and then to come back and sell you my secret for enough to buy a barrel. If you have anything to say, speak now, continued Middleton, restraining with difficulty the impatience that urged him to betray his feelings. I am dry, and I can never talk with elegance when my throat is husky, Captain. How much will you give to know what I can tell you? Let it be something handsome, such as one gentleman can offer to another. I believe it would be better justice to order the drummer to pay you a visit, fellow. To what does your boasted secret relate? Matrimony. A wife and no wife. A pretty face and a rich bride. Do I speak plain now, Captain? If you know anything relating to my wife, say it at once. You need not fear for your reward. I, Captain, I have drove many a bargain in my time, and sometimes I have been paid in money, and sometimes I have been paid in promises. Now the last are what I call pinching food. Name your price. Twenty. No, damn it, it's worth thirty dollars if it's worth a cent. Here, then, is your money, but remember, if you tell me nothing worth knowing, I have a force that can easily deprive you of it again, and punish your insolence in the bargain. The fellow examined the bank bills he received with a jealous eye, and then pocketed them, apparently well satisfied of their being genuine. I like a northern note, he said very coolly. They have a character to lose like myself. No fear of me, Captain. I am a man of honor, and I shall not tell you a word more, nor a word less than I know of my own knowledge to be true. Proceed, then, without further delay or I may repent, and order you to be deprived of all your gains, the silver as well as the notes. Honor, if you die for it, returned the miscreant, holding up a hand in affected horror at so treacherous a threat. Well, Captain, you must know that gentlemen don't all live by the same calling. Some keep what they've got, and some get what they can. You've been a thief. I scorn the word. I have been a humanity hunter. Do you know what that means? Aye, it has many interpretations. Some people think the woolly heads are miserable, working on hot plantations under a broiling sun, and all such sorts of inconveniences. Well, Captain, I have been in my time a man who has been willing to give them the pleasures of variety, at least, by changing the scene for them. You understand me? You are in plain language a kidnapper. Have been, my worthy Captain, have been, but just now a little reduced, like a merchant who leaves off selling tobacco by the hogshead, to deal in it by the yard. I have been a soldier, too, in my day. What is said to be the great secret of our trade, can you tell me that? I know not, said Middleton, beginning to tire of the fellow's trifling. Courage! No, legs, legs to fight with, and legs to run away with, and therein you see my two callings agreed. My legs are none of the best just now, and without legs a kidnapper would carry on a losing trade. But then there are men enough left, better provided than I am. Stolen? groaned the horror-struck husband. 
honor travels, as sure as you are standing still. Villain, what reason have you for believing a thing so shocking? Hands off, hands off, do you think my tongue can do its work for the better for a little squeezing of the throat? Have patience, and you shall know it all. But if you treat me so ungenteely again, I shall be obliged to call in the assistance of the lawyers. Say on, but if you utter a single word more or less than the truth, expect instant vengeance. Are you fool enough to believe what such a scoundrel as I am tells you, Captain, unless it has probability to back it? I know you are not, therefore. I will give my facts and my opinions, and then leave you to chew on them while I go and drink of your generosity. I know a man who was called Abram White. I believe the knave took the name to show his enmity to the race of blacks. But this gentleman is now, and has been for years, to my certain knowledge, a regular translator of the human body from one state to another. I have dealt with him in my time, and a cheating dog he is. No more honor in him than meat in my stomach. I saw him here in this very town, the day of your wedding. He was in company with his wife's brother, and pretended to be a settler on the hunt for a new land. A noble set they were, to carry on business, seven sons, each of them as tall as your sergeant with his cap on. Well, the moment I heard that your wife was lost, I saw at once that Abram had laid his hands on her. Do you know this? Can this be true? What reason have you to fancy a thing so wild? Reason enough. I know Abram White. Now, will you add a trifle, just to keep my throat from parching? Go, go, you are stupefied with drink already, miserable man, and know not what you say. Go, go, and beware the drummer. Experience is a good guide. The fellow called after a retiring Middleton, and then turning with a chuckling laugh, like one well satisfied with himself, he made the best of his way towards the shop of the sutler. A hundred times in the course of that night did Middleton fancy that the communication of the miscreant was entitled to some attention and as often did he reject the idea as too wild and visionary for another thought. He was awakened early on the following morning, after passing a restless and nearly sleepless night, by his orderly, who came to report that a man was found dead on the parade, at no great distance from his quarters. Throwing on his clothes, he proceeded to the spot, and beheld the individual with whom he had held the preceding conference, in the precise situation in which he had first been found. The miserable wretch had fallen a victim to his intemperance. This revolting fact was sufficiently proclaimed by his obtruding eyeballs, his bloated countenance, and the nearly insufferable odors that were even then exhaling from his carcass. Disgusted with the odious spectacle, the youth was turning from the sight, after ordering the corpse to be removed, when the position of one of the dead men's hands struck him. On examination, he found the forefinger extended, as if in the act of writing in the sand, with the following incomplete sentence, nearly illegible, but yet in the state to be deciphered. Captain, it is true, as I am a gentle. He had either died, or fallen into a sleep, the forerunner of his death, before the latter word was finished. Concealing this fact from the others, Middleton repeated his orders, and departed. The pertinacity of the deceased, and all the circumstances united, induced him to set on foot some secret inquiries, he found that a family answering the description which had been given him had in fact passed the place the day of his nuptials. They were traced among the margin of the Mississippi for some distance, until they took boat and ascended the river to its confluence with the Missouri. Here they had disappeared like hundreds of others in pursuit of the hidden wealth of the interior. Furnished with these facts, Middleton detailed the small guard of his most trusty men, took leave of Don Augustine without declaring his hopes or his fears and having arrived at the indicated point, he pushed into the wilderness in pursuit. It was not difficult to trace a train like that of Ishmael, until he was well assured its object lay far beyond the usual limits of the settlements. This circumstance in itself quickened his suspicions, and gave additional force to his hopes of final success. After getting beyond the assistance of verbal directions, the anxious husband had recourse to the usual signs of a trail in order to follow the fugitives. This he also found a task of no difficulty, until he reached the hard and unyielding soil of the rolling prairies. Here, indeed, he was completely at fault. He found himself at length compelled to divide his followers, appointing a place of rendezvous at a distant day, and to endeavor to find a lost trail by multiplying, as much as possible, the number of his eyes. He had been alone a week, when accident brought him in contact with the trapper and the bee-hunter. 
part of their interview have been related, and the reader can readily imagine the explanations that succeeded the tale he recounted, and which led, as has already been seen, to the recovery of his bride. End of chapter 15、16、The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. These likelihoods confirm her flight from hence. Therefore, I pray you, stay not to discourse, but mount you presently. Shakespeare. An hour had slid by in hasty and nearly incoherent questions and answers before Middleton, hanging over his recovered treasure with that sort of jealous watchfulness with which a miser would regard his hoards, closed the disjointed narrative of his own proceedings by demanding, "And you, my Inez, in what manner were you treated?" "In everything but the great injustice they did in separating me so forcibly from my friends, as well perhaps as the circumstances of my captors would allow." I think the man who is certainly the master here is but a new beginner in wickedness. He quarrelled frightfully in my presence with the wretch who seized me, and then they made an impious bargain to which I was compelled to acquiesce, and to which they bound me as well as themselves by oaths. Ah, Middleton, I fear the heretics are not so heedful of their vows as we who are nurtured in the bosom of the true Church. Believe it or not, these villains are of no religion. Did they forswear themselves? No, not perjured. But was it not awful to call upon the good God to witness so sinful a compact? And so we think, Inez, as truly as the most virtuous cardinal of Rome. But how did they observe their oath, and what was its purport? They conditioned to leave me unmolested and free from their odious presence, provided I would give a pledge to make no effort to escape. And that I would not even show myself until a time that my master saw fit to name. And that time, demanded the impatient Middleton, who so well knew the religious scruples of his wife. That time, it has already passed. I was sworn by my patron saint, and faithfully did I keep the vow until the man they call Ishmael forgot the terms by offering violence. I then made my appearance on the rock, for the time too was past. Though I even think Father Ignatius would have absolved me from the vow on account of the treachery of my keepers, if he had not muttered the youth between his compressed teeth, I would have absolved him for ever from his spiritual care of your conscience. You, Middleton, returned his wife, looking up into his flushed face, while a bright blush suffused her own sweet countenance. You may receive my vows, but surely you can have no power to absolve me from their observance. No, 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 Inez. You are right. I know but little of these conscientious subtilities, and I am anything but a priest. Yet tell me, what has induced these monsters to play this desperate game to trifle thus with my happiness? You know my ignorance of the world, and how ill I am qualified to furnish reasons for the conduct of beings so different from any I have ever seen before. But does not love of money drive men to acts even worse than this? I believe they thought that an aged and wealthy father could be tempted to pay them a rich ransom for his child, and perhaps, she added, stealing an inquiring glance through her tears at the attentive Middleton, they counted something on the fresh affections of a bridegroom. They might have extracted the blood from my heart, drop by drop. Yes, resumed his young and timid wife. Instantly withdrawing the stolen look she had hazarded, and hurriedly pursuing the train of the discourse, as if glad to make him forget the liberty she had just taken, I have been told there are men so base as to perjure themselves at the altar in order to command the gold of ignorant and confiding girls, and if love of money will lead to such baseness, we may surely expect it will hurry those who devote themselves to gain into acts of lesser fraud. It must be so. And now, Inez, though I am here to guard you with my life, and we are in possession of this rock, our difficulties, perhaps our dangers, are not ended. You will summon all your courage to meet the trial and prove yourself a soldier's wife, my Inez. I am ready to depart this instant. The letter you sent by the physician had prepared me to hope for the best, and I have everything arranged for flight at the shortest warning. Let us then leave this place and join our friends. Friends. Interrupted Inez, glancing her eyes around the little tent in quest of the form of Ellen. I too 
have a friend who must not be forgotten, but who is pledged to pass the remainder of her life with us. She is gone. Middleton gently led her from the spot, as he smilingly answered, She may have had, like myself, her own private communications for some favored ear. The young man had not, however, done justice to the motives of Ellen Wade. The sensitive and intelligent girl had readily perceived how little her presence was necessary in the interview that had just been related, and had retired with that intuitive delicacy of feeling, which seems to belong more properly to her sex. She was now to be seen seated on a point of the rock, with her person so entirely enveloped in her dress as to conceal her features. Here she had remained for near an hour, no one approaching to address her, and as it appeared to her own quick and jealous eyes, totally unobserved. In the latter particular, however, even the vigilance of the quick-sighted Owen was deceived. The first act of Paul Hover, on finding himself the master of Ishmael's citadel, had been to sound the note of victory after the quaint and ludicrous manner that is so often practiced among the borders of the West. Flapping his sides with his hands, as the conquering gamecock is wont to do with his wings, he raised a loud and laughable imitation of the exultation of this bird. A cry, which might have proved a dangerous challenge had any one of the athletic sons of the squatter been within hearing. "'This has been a regular knock-down and drag-out,' he cried, "'and no bones broke.' How now, old trapper? You have been one of your training, platoon, rank, and file soldiers in your day, and have you seen forts taken and batteries stormed before this? Am I right? Ay, ay, that have I, answered the old man, who still maintained his post at the foot of the rock, so little disturbed by what he had just witnessed as to return the grin of Paul, with a hearty indulgence in his own silent and peculiar laughter. You have gone through the exploit like men. Now tell me, is it not in rule to call over the names of the living and to bury the dead after every bloody battle? Some did, and others some didn't. When Sir William pushed the German Descow through the defiles at the foot of the hoary, your Sir William was drawn to Sir Paul and knew nothing of regularity. So here begins the roll call. By and by, old man, what between bee hunting and buffalo humps and certain other matters? I have been too busy to ask your name, for I intend to begin with my rear guard, well knowing that my man in front is too busy to answer. Lord, lad, I've been called in my time by as many names as there are people among whom I have dwelt. Now the Delawares name me for my eyes, and I was called after the far-sighted hawk. Then, agent, the settlers in the Otsego Hills christened me anew, from the fashion of my leggings, and various have been the names by which I have gone through life, but little will it matter when the time shall come that all are to be mustered face to face by what titles a mortal has played his part. I humbly trust I shall be able to answer to any of mine in a loud and manly voice. Paul paid little or no attention to this reply, more than half of which was lost in the distance, but pursuing the humor of the moment, he called out in a stentorian voice to the naturalist to answer to his name. Dr. Battius had not thought it necessary to push his success beyond the comfortable niche which accident had so opportunely formed for his protection, and in which he now reposed from his labors, with a pleasing consciousness of security, added to great exultation at the possession of the botanical treasure already mentioned. Mount, mount, my worthy mole-catcher, come and behold the prospect of skirting Ishmael. Come and look nature boldly in the face, and not go sneaking any longer among the prairie grass and mullen tops, like a gobbler nibbling for grasshoppers. The mouth of the light-hearted and reckless bee-hunter was instantly closed, and he was rendered as mute as he had just been boisterous and talkative by the appearance of Ellen Wade. When the melancholy maiden took her seat on the point of the rock as mentioned, Paul affected to employ himself in conducting a close inspection of the household effects of the squatter. He rummaged the drawers of Esther with no delicate hands, scattered the rustic finery of her girls on the ground, without the least deference to its quality or elegance, and tossed her pots and kettles here and there, as though they had been vessels of wood instead of iron. All this industry was, however, manifestly without an object. He reserved nothing for himself, not even appearing conscious of the nature of the articles which suffered by his familiarity. When he had examined the inside of every cabin, taken a fresh survey of the spot where he had confined the children, and where he had thoroughly secured them with cords, and kicked one of the pails of the women, like a football fifty feet into the air, in sheer wantonness, 
he returned to the edge of the rock, and thrusting both his hands through his wampum belt, he began to whistle the Kentucky Hunters, as diligently as if he had been hired to supply his auditors with music by the hour. In this manner he passed the remainder of the time, until Middleton, as has been related, led Enos forth from the tent, and gave a new direction to the thoughts of the whole party. He summoned Paul from his flourish of music, tore the doctor from the study of his plant, and as acknowledged leader, gave the necessary orders for immediate departure. In the bustle and confusion that were likely to succeed such a mandate, there was little opportunity to indulge in complaints or reflections. As the adventurers had not come unprepared for victory, each individual employed himself in such offices as were best adapted to his strength and situation. The trapper had already made himself master of the patient Asinus, who was quietly feeding at no great distance from the rock, and he was now busy in fitting his back with the complicated machinery that Dr. Battius saw fit to term a saddle of his own invention. The naturalist himself seized upon his portfolios, herbals, and collection of insects, which he quickly transferred from the encampment of the squatter to certain pockets in the aforesaid ingenious invention, and in which the trapper, as uniformly, cast away the moment his back was turned. Paul showed his dexterity in removing such light articles as Enos and Ellen had prepared for their flight to the foot of the citadel, while Middleton, after mingling threats and promises, in order to induce the children to remain quietly in their bondage, assisted the females to descend. As time began to press upon them, and there was great danger of Ishmael's returning, these several movements were made with singular industry and dispatch. The trapper bestowed such articles as he conceived were necessary to the comfort of the weaker and more delicate members of the party, in those pockets from which he had so unceremoniously expelled the treasures of the unconscious naturalist, and then gave way for Middleton to place Inez in one of those seats which he had prepared on the back of the animal for her and her companion. "'Go, child,' the old man said, motioning to Ellen to follow the example of the lady, and turning his head a little anxiously to examine the waist behind him. It cannot be long afore the owner of this place will be coming to look after his household, and he is not a man to give up his property, however obtained, without complaint. It is true, cried Middleton. We have wasted moments that are precious, and have the utmost need for industry. Ay, ay, I thought it, and would have said it, Captain, but I remembered how your grandfather used to love to look upon the face of her he led away for a wife in the days of his youth and his happiness. "'Tis nature, tis nature, and tis wiser to give way little before its feelings than to try to stop a current that will have its course." Ellen advanced to the side of the beast, and seizing Inez by the hand, she said with heartfelt warmth, after struggling to suppress an emotion that nearly choked her, "'God bless you, sweet lady. I hope you will forget and forgive the wrongs you have received from my uncle.' The humbled and sorrowful girl could say no more her voice becoming entirely inaudible in an ungovernable burst of grief. "'How is this?' cried Middleton. "'Did you not say, Inez, that this excellent young woman was to accompany us, and to live with us for the remainder of her life, or at least until she found some more agreeable residence for herself?' "'I did, and I still hope it. She has always given me reason to believe that after having shown so much commiseration and friendship in my misery, she would not desert me, should happier times return.' I cannot, I ought not, continued Owen, getting the better of her momentary weakness. It has pleased God to cast my lot among these people, and I ought not to quit them. It would be adding the appearance of treachery to what will already seem bad enough with one of his opinions. He has been kind to me, an orphan, after his rough customs, and I cannot steal from him at such a moment. She is just as much a relation of skirting Ishmael as I am a bishop, said Paul, with a loud hem, as if his throat wanted clearing. If the old fellow has done the honest thing by her, in giving her a morsel of venison now and then, or a spoon around his hominy dish, hasn't she paid him in teaching the young devils to read their Bible, or in helping old Esser to put her finery in shape and fashion? Tell me that a drone has a sting, and I'll believe you as easily as I will that this young woman is a debtor to any of the tribe of Bush. It is but little matter who owes me, or where I am in debt. There are none to care for a girl who is fatherless and motherless and whose nearest kin are the offcasts of all honest people. No, no, go, lady, and heaven forever bless you. I am better here in this desert, where there are none to know my shame. Now, old trapper, retorted Paul, this is what I call knowing which way the wind blows. 
You are a man that has seen life, and you know something of fashions. I put it to your judgment plainly. Isn't it in the nature of things for the hive to swarm when the young get their growth? And if children will quit their parents, ought one who is of no kith or ken? Ish, interrupted the man he addressed. Hector is discontented. Say it out plainly, pup. What is it, dog? What is it? The venerable hound had risen, and was scenting the fresh breeze, which continued to sweep heavily over the prairie. At the words of his master, he growled and contracted the muscles of his lips, as if half disposed to threaten with the remnants of his teeth. The younger dog, who was resting after the chase of the morning, also made some signs that his nose detected a taint in the air, and then the two resumed their slumbers as if they had done enough. The trapper seized the bridle of the ass and cried, urging the beast onward. There are no time for words. The squatter and his brood are within a mile or two of this blessed spot. Middleton lost all recollection of Owen in the danger which now so imminently beset his recovered bride. Nor is it necessary to add that Dr. Battius did not wait for a second admonition to commence his retreat. Following the route indicated by the old man, they turned the rock in a body and pursued their way as fast as possible across the prairie under the favor of the cover it afforded. Paul Hover, however, remained in his tracks, sullenly leaning on his rifle. Near a minute had elapsed before he was observed by Ellen, who had buried her face in her hands, to conceal her fancied desolation from herself. "'Why do you not fly?' the weeping girl exclaimed, the instant she perceived she was not alone. "'I'm not used to it.' "'My uncle will soon be here. You have nothing to hope from his pity.' "'Nor from that of his niece, I reckon. Let him come. He can only knock me on the head. Paul, Paul, if you love me, fly.' "'Alone?' If I do, may I be, if you value your life, fly. I value it not, compared to you. Pa! Ellen! She extended both her hands and burst into another and still more violent flood of tears. The bee-hunter put one of his sturdy arms around her waist, and in another moment he was urging her over the plain in rapid pursuit of their flying friends. End of chapter 16《of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. Approach the chamber and destroy your sight with a new gorgon do, not bid me speak. See, and then speak yourselves. Shakespeare. The little run, which supplied the family of the squatter with water, and nourished the trees and bushes that grew near the base of the rocky eminence, took its rise at no great distance from the latter, in a small thicket of cottonwood and vines. Hither, then, the trapper directed the flight, as to the place affording the only available cover in so pressing an emergency. It will be remembered that the sagacity of the old man, which, from long practice in similar scenes, amounted nearly to an instinct in all cases of sudden danger, had first induced him to take this course, as it placed the hill between them and the approaching party. Favored by this circumstance, he succeeded in reaching the bushes in sufficient time, and Paul Hover had just hurried the breathless Ellen into the tangled bush, as Ishmael gained the summit of the rock in the manner already described, where he stood like a man momentarily bereft of sense, gazing at the confusion which had been created among his shadows, or at his gagged and bound children, who had been safely bestowed, by the forethought of the bee-hunter, under the cover of a bark roof, in a sort of irregular pile. A long rifle would have thrown a bullet from the height on which the squatter now stood, into the very cover where the fugitives, who had wrought all this mischief, were clustered. The trapper was the first to speak, as the man on whose intelligence and experience they all depended for counsel, after running his eye over the different individuals who gathered about him, in order to see that none were missing. "'Ah, nature is nature, and has done its work,' he said, nodding to the exulting paw with a smile of approbation. "'I thought it would be a hard for those who had so often met in fair and foul.' by starlight and under the clouded moon, to part at last in anger. Now there is little time to lose in talk, and everything to gain by industry. It cannot be long afore some of the yonder brood will be nosing along the earth for our trail, and should they find it, 
as find it they surely will, and should they push us to a stand on our courage, the dispute must be settled with the rifle. Which may he in heaven forbid. Captain, can you lead us to the place where any of your warriors lie? For the stout sons of the squatter will make a manly brush of it, or I am but a little of a judge in warlike dispositions. The place of rendezvous is many leagues from this, on the banks of La Platte. It is bad, it is bad. If fighting is to be done, it is always wise to enter on it on equal terms. But what has one so near his time to do with ill blood and hot blood at his heart? Listen to what a gray head and some experience have to offer, and then, if any among you can point out a wiser fashion for a retreat, we can just follow his design and forget that I have spoken. This thicket stretches for near a mile, as it may be slanting from the rock, and leads towards the sunset instead of the settlements. "'Enough, enough!' cried Middleton, too impatient to wait until the deliberative and perhaps loquacious old man could end his minute explanation. "'Time is too precious for words. Let us fly!' The trapper made a gesture of compliance, and turning in his tracks, he led Asinus across the trembling earth of the swale, and quickly emerged on the hard ground, on the side opposite to the encampment of the squatter. "'If old Ishmael gets a squint at that highway through the brush,' cried Paul, casting as he left the place a hasty glance at the broad trail the party had made through the thicket. "'He'll need no fingerboard to tell him which way his road lies, but let him follow. I know the vagabond would gladly cross his breed with a little honest blood, but if any son of his ever gets to be the husband of—' "'Hush, Paul, hush!' said the terrified young woman, who leaned on his arm for support. "'Your voice might be heard.' The bee-hunter was silent, though he did not cease to cast ominous looks behind him, as they flew along the edge of the run, which sufficiently betrayed the belligerent condition of his mind. As each one was busy for himself, but a few minutes elapsed before the party rose the swell of the prairie, and descending without a moment's delay on the opposite side— they were at once removed from every danger of being seen by the sons of Ishmael, unless the pursuers should happen to fall upon their trail. The old man now profited by the formation of the land to take another direction, with a view to elude pursuit, as a vessel changes her course in fogs and darkness, to escape from the vigilance of her enemies. Two hours passed in the utmost diligence enabled them to make a half-circuit around the rock, and to reach a point that was exactly opposite to the original direction of their flight. To most of the fugitives their situation was as entirely unknown as is that of a ship in the middle of the ocean to the uninstructed voyager. But the old man proceeded at every turn, and through every bottom, with a decision that inspired his followers with confidence, as it spoke favorably of his own knowledge of the localities. His hound, stopping now and then to catch the expression of his eye, had preceded the trapper throughout the whole distance, with as much certainty as though a previous and intelligible communion between them had established the route by which they were to proceed. But, at the expiration of the time, just named, the dog suddenly came to a stand, and then seating himself on the prairie, he snuffed the air a moment, and began a low and piteous whining. "'Ay, pup, ay, I know the spot, I know the spot.' and reason there is to remember it well, said the old man, stopping by the side of his uneasy associate, until those who followed had time to come up. Now, yonder is a thicket before us, he continued, pointing forward, where we may lie till tall trees grow on these naked fields, afore any of the squatter's kin will venture to molest us. This is the spot where the body of the dead man lay, cried Biddleton, examining the place with an eye that revolted at the recollection. The very same, but whether his friends have put him in the bosom of the ground or not remains to be seen. The hound knows the scent, but seems to be a little at loss too. It is therefore necessary that you advance, friend bee-hunter, to examine, while I tarry to keep the dogs from complaining in too loud a voice. I exclaimed Paul, thrusting his hand into his shaggy locks, like one who thought it prudent to hesitate before he undertook so formidable an adventure. Now hark ye, old trapper! I've stood in my thinnest cottons in the midst of a many a swarm that has lost its queen bee without winking, and let me tell you, the man who can do that is not likely to fear any living son of skirting Ishmael, but as to meddling with dead men's bones, why it is neither my calling nor my inclination. So, after thanking you for the favor of your choice, as they say, when they make a man a corporal in Kentucky, 
I decline serving. The old man turned a disappointed look towards Middleton, who was much too occupied in solacing Inez to observe his embarrassment, which was, however, suddenly relieved from a quarter whence, from previous circumstances, there was little reason to expect such a demonstration of fortitude. Dr. Battius had rendered himself a little remarkable throughout the whole of the preceding retreat, for the exceeding diligence with which he had laboured to effect that desirable object. So very conspicuous was his zeal, indeed, as to have entirely gotten the better of all his ordinary predilections. The worthy naturalist belonged to that species of discoverers who make the worst possible travelling companions to a man who has reason to be in a hurry. No stone, no bush, no plant is ever suffered to escape the examination of their vigilant eyes, and thunder may mutter, and rain fall, without disturbing the abstraction of their reveries. Not so, however, with the disciple of Linnaeus, during the momentous period that it remained a mooted point at the tribunal of his better judgment, whether the stout descendants of the squatter were not likely to dispute his right to traverse the prairie in freedom. The highest-blooded and best-trained hound, with his new game in view, could not have run with an eye more riveted than that with which the doctor had pursued his curvilinear course. It was perhaps lucky for his fortitude that he was ignorant of the artifice of the trapper in leading them around the citadel of Ishmael, and that he had imbibed the soothing impression that every inch of prairie he traversed was just so much added to the distance between his own person and the detested rock. Notwithstanding the momentary shock he certainly experienced, when he discovered this error, he now boldly volunteered to enter the thicket in which there was some reason to believe the body of the murdered Asa still lay. Perhaps the naturalist was urged to show his spirit on this occasion by some secret consciousness that his excessive industry in the retreat might be liable to misconstruction, and it is certain that, whatever might be his peculiar notions of danger from the quick, his habits and his knowledge had placed him far above the apprehension of suffering harm from any communication with the dead. "'If there is any service to be performed which requires the perfect command of the nervous system,' said the man of science, with a look that was slightly blustering. You have only to give a direction to his intellectual faculties, and here stands one on whose physical powers you may depend. The man is given to speak in parables, muttered the single-minded trapper, but I conclude there is always some meaning hidden in his words, though it is as hard to find sense in his speeches as to discover three eagles on the same tree. It will be wise, friend, to make a cover, lest the sons of the squatter should be out skirting on our trail. And as you well know, there is some reason to fear yonder thicket contains a sight that may horrify a woman's mind. Are you man enough to look death in the face? Or shall I run the risk of the hounds raising an outcry and go in myself? You see the pup is willing to run with an open mouth already. Am I man enough? Venerable trapper, our communications have a recent origin, or thy interrogatory might have a tendency to embroil us in angry disputation. Am I a man enough? I claim to be the class Mammalia, Order, Primates, Genus, Homo. Such are my physical attributes. Of my moral properties, let posterity speak. It becomes me to be mute. Physic may do for such as relish it. To my taste and judgment it is neither palatable nor healthy." but morals never did harm to any living mortal, be it that he was a sojourner in the forest, or a dweller in the midst of glazed windows and smoking chimneys. It is only a few hard words that divide us, friend, for I am of opinion that, with use and freedom, we should come to understand one another, and mainly settle down into the same judgments of mankind and of the ways of the world. Quiet, Hector, quiet! What ruffles your temper, pup? Is it not used to the scent of human blood? The doctor bestowed a gracious but commiserating smile on the philosopher of nature as he retrograded a step or two from the place whither he had been impelled by his excess of spirit in order to reapply with less expenditure of breath and with a greater freedom of air and attitude. A homo is certainly a homo, he said, stretching forth an arm in an argumentative manner. So far as the animal functions extend, there are the connecting links of harmony, order, conformity, and design between the whole genus, but there the resemblance ends. Man may be degraded to the very margin of the line which separates him from the brute, by ignorance, or he may be elevated to a communion with the great master spirit of all, by knowledge. 
Nay, I know not if time and opportunity were given him, but he might become the master of all learning, and consequently equal to the great moving principle. The old man, who stood leaning on his rifle in a thoughtful attitude, shook his head as he answered with a native steadiness that entirely eclipsed the imposing air which his antagonist had seen fit to assume. This is neither more nor less than mortal wickedness. Here have I been a dweller in the earth for four score and six changes of the seasons, and all that time have I looked at the growing and dying trees, and yet do I not know the reasons why the bud starts under the summer sun, or the leaf falls when it is pinched by the frost. Your larning, though it's a man's boast, is folly in the eyes of him who sits in the clouds and looks down in sorrow at the pride and vanity of his creatures. Many is the hour that I've passed, lying in the shades of the woods, or stretched upon the hills of these open fields, looking up into the blue skies, where I could fancy the Great One had taken his stand, and was solemnizing on the waywardness of man and brute, below, as I myself had often looked at the ants tumbling over each other in their eagerness, though in a way and a fashion more suited to his mightiness and power. Knowledge! It is his plaything! Say, you who think it is easy to climb into judgment a seat above, can you tell me anything of this beginning and the end? Nay, you're a dealer in ailings and cures. What is life, and what is death? Why does the eagle live so long, and why is the time of the butterfly so short? Tell me a simpler thing. Why is this hound so uneasy, while you, who have passed your days of looking into books, can see no reason to be disturbed? The doctor, who had been a little astounded by the dignity and energy of the old man, drew a long breath, like a sullen wrestler who was just released from the throttling grasp of his antagonist, and seized on the opportunity of the pause to reply, It is his instinct. And what is the gift of instinct? An inferior gradation of reason, a sort of mysterious combination of thought and matter. And what is that which you call thought? Venerable, venerator, this is a method of reasoning which sets at naught the uses of definitions, and such as I do assure you is not at all tolerated in the schools. Then is there more cunning in your schools than I had thought, for it is a certain method of showing them their vanity? Returned the trapper, suddenly abandoning a discussion from which the naturalist was just beginning to anticipate great delight by turning to his dog, whose restlessness he attempted to appease by playing with his ears. This is foolish, Hector, more like an untrained pup than a sensible hound, one who has got his education by hard experience, and not by nosing over the trails of other dogs, as a boy in the settlements follows on the track of his masters, be it right or be it wrong. Well, friend, you who can do so much, are you equal to looking into the thicket, or must I go in myself? The doctor again assumed his air of resolution, and, without further parlance, proceeded to do as desired. The dogs were so far restrained by the remonstrances of the old man as to confine their noise to low but often repeated whinings. When they saw the naturalist advanced, the pup, however, broke through all restraint and made a swift circuit around his person, scenting the earth as he proceeded, and then, returning to his companion, he howled aloud. "'The squatter and his brood have left a strong scent on the earth.' said the old man, watching as he spoke for some signal from his learned pioneer to follow. I hope yonder school-bred man knows enough to remember the errand on which I have set him. Dr. Battius had already disappeared in the bushes, and the trapper was beginning to betray additional evidences of impatience, when the person of the former was seen retiring from the thicket backwards, with his face fastened on the place he had just left, as if his look was bound in the thraldom of some charm. "'Here is something scary by the wilderness of the creature's countenance,' exclaimed the old man, relinquishing his hold of Hector, and moving stoutly to the side of the totally unconscious naturalist. "'How is it, friend? Have you found a new leaf in your book of wisdom?' "'It is a bacillus, muttered the doctor, whose altered visage betrayed the utter confusion which beset his faculties. "'An animal of the order serpents. I had thought its attributes were fabulous.' but mighty nature is equal to all that man can imagine. What is it? What is it? The snakes of the prairies are harmless, unless it be now, and then an angered rattler, and he always gives you a notice with his tail, afore he works his mischief with his fangs. Lord, Lord, what a humbling thing is fear! 
Here is one who in common delivers words too big for a humble mouth to hold, so much beside himself that his voice is as shrill as the whistle of the whippoorwill. Courage! What is it, man? What is it? A prodigy, a lucis naturae, a monster that nature has delighted to form, in order to exhibit her power. Never before have I witnessed such an utter confusion in her laws, or a specimen that so completely bids defiance to the distinctions of class and genera. Let me record its appearance, fumbling for his tablets with hands that trembled too much to perform their office. While time and opportunity are allowed, eyes enthralling, color various, complex, and profound. One would think the man was crazed, with his enthralling looks and piebald colors, interrupted the discontented trapper, who began to grow a little uneasy that his party was at all this time neglecting to seek the protection of some cover. If there is a reptile in the brush, show me the creature, and should it refuse to depart peaceably, why, there must be a quarrel for the possession of the place. There, said the doctor, pointing into a dense mass of the thicket, to a spot within fifty feet of that where they both stood. The trapper turned his look, with perfect composure, in the required direction, but the instant his practiced glance met the object which had so utterly upset the philosophy of the naturalist, he gave a start himself threw his rifle rapidly forward, and as instantly recovered it, as if a second flash of thought convinced him he was wrong. Neither the instinctive movement nor the sudden recollection was without a sufficient object. At the very margin of the thicket, and in absolute contact with the earth, lay an animate ball, that might easily, by the singularity and fierceness of its aspect, have justified a disturbed condition of the naturalist mind. It were difficult to describe the shape or colors of this extraordinary substance except to say, in general terms, that it was nearly spherical, and exhibited all the hues of the rainbow, intermingled without reference to harmony, and without any very ostensible design. The predominant hues were a black and bright vermilion. With these, however, the several tints of white, yellow, and crimson were strangely and wildly blended. Had this been all, it would have been difficult to have pronounced that the object was possessed of life or lay motionless as any stone. But a pair of dark, glaring, and moving eyeballs, which watched with jealousy the smallest movement of the trapper and his companion, sufficiently established the important fact of its possessing vitality. Your reptile is a scouter, or I'm no judge of Indian paints and Indian deviltries, muttered the old man, dropping the butt of his weapon to the ground, and gazing with a steady eye at the frightful object, as he leaned on its barrel in an attitude of great composure. He wants to face us out of sight and reason, and make us think the head of a redskin is a stone covered with the autumn leaf, or he has some other devilish artifice in his mind. Is the animal human? demanded the doctor. Of the genus Homo? I had fancied it a nondescript. It's as human, and as mortal too, as a warrior of these prairies is ever known to be. I have seen a time when a redskin would have shown a foolish daring to peep out of his ambushment in that fashion on a hunter I could name, but who is too old now and too near his time to be anything better than a miserable trapper. It will be well to speak to the imp, and to let him know he deals with men whose beards are grown. Come forth from your cover, friend, he continued in the language of the extensive tribes of the Dakotas. There is room on the prairie for another warrior. The eyes appeared to glare more fiercely than ever, but the mass which, according to the trapper's opinion, was neither more nor less than a human head, shorn, as usual among the warriors of the West, of its hair, still continued without motion or any other sign of life. "'It is a mistake!' exclaimed the doctor. "'The animal is not even of the class Mammalia, much less a man.' "'So much for your knowledge,' returned the trapper, laughing with great exultation. So much for the learning of one who has looked into so many books that his eyes are not able to tell a moose from a wildcat. Now my Hector here is a dog of education after his fashion, and though the meanest primer in the settlements would puzzle his information, you could not cheat the hound in a matter like this. As you think the object no man, you shall see his whole formation, and then let an ignorant old trapper who never willingly passed a day within the reach of a spelling book in his life know by what name to call it. Mind, I mean no violence, but just to start the devil from his ambushment. The trapper very deliberately examined the priming of his rifle, 
taking care to make as great a parade as possible of his hostile intentions in going through the necessary evolutions with the weapon. When he thought the stranger began to apprehend some danger, he very deliberately presented the piece and called aloud, Now, friend, I am all for peace, or all for war, as you may say. No! Well, it is no man, as the wiser one here says, and there can be no harm in just firing into the bunch of leaves. The muzzle of the rifle fell as he concluded, and the weapon was gradually settling into a steady, and what would easily have proved a fatal aim, when a tall Indian sprang from beneath the bed of leaves and brush, which he had collected about his person at the approach of the party, and stood upright, uttering the exclamation, Wah! End of chapter 17「Eighteen of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. My visor is Philemon's roof. Within the house is Jove. Shakespeare. The trapper, who had meditated no violence, dropped his rifle again, and laughing at the success of his experiment, with great seeming self-complacency, he drew the astounded gaze of the naturalist from the person of the savage to himself, by saying, The imps will lie for hours, like sleeping alligators, brooding their deviltries and dreams and other craftiness, until such time as they see some real danger is at hand, and then they look to themselves, the same as other mortals. But this is a scouter in his war-paint. There should be more of his tribe at no great distance. Let us draw the truth out of him for an unlucky war-party may prove more dangerous to us than a visit from the whole family of the squatter. "'It is truly a desperate and dangerous species,' said the doctor, relieving his amazement by a breath that seemed to exhaust his lungs of air. "'A violent race, and one that it is difficult to define or class within the usual boundaries of definitions. Speak to him, therefore, but let thy words be strong in amity.' The old man cast a keen eye on every side of him to ascertain the important particular whether the stranger was supported by any associates, and then, making the usual signs of peace, by exhibiting the palm of his naked hand, he boldly advanced. In the meantime, the Indian betrayed no evidence of uneasiness. He suffered the trapper to draw nigh, maintaining by his own mien and attitude a striking air of dignity and fearlessness. Perhaps the wary warrior also knew that, owing to the difference in their weapons, he should be placed more on an equality by being brought nearer to the strangers. As a description of this individual may furnish some idea of the personal appearance of a whole race, it may be well to detain the narrative in order to present it to the reader in our hasty and imperfect manner. Would the truant eyes of Alston or Greenall turn, but for a time, from their gaze at the models of antiquity to contemplate this wrong and humble people, little would be left for such inferior artists as ourselves to delineate. The Indian in question was in every particular a warrior of fine stature and admirable proportions. As he cast aside his mask, composed of such party-colored leaves as he had hurriedly collected, his countenance appeared in all the gravity, the dignity, and, it may be added, in the terror of his profession. The outlines of his lineaments were strikingly noble, and nearly approaching to Roman, though the secondary features of his face were slightly marked with the well-known traces of his Asiatic origin. The peculiar tint of the skin, which in itself is so well designed to aid the effect of a martial expression, had received an additional aspect of wild ferocity from the colors of the war-paint. But, as if he disdained the usual artifices of his people, he bore none of those strange and horrid devices with which the children of the forest are accustomed, like the more civilized heroes of the mustache, to back their reputation for courage, contenting himself with a broad and deep shadowing of black that served as a sufficient and an admirable foil to the brighter gleamings of his native swarthiness. His head was, as usual, shaved to the crown, where a large and gallant scalp-lock seemed to challenge the grasp of his enemies. 
The ornaments that were ordinarily pendant from the cartilages of his ears had been removed on account of his present pursuit. His body, notwithstanding the lateness of the season, was nearly naked, and the portion which was clad bore a vestment no warmer than a light robe of the finest dressed deerskin, beautifully stained with the rude design of some daring exploit, and which was carelessly worn, as if more in pride than from any unmanly regard to comfort. His leggings were of bright scarlet cloth, the only evidence about his person that he had held communion with the traders of the pale-faces. But, as if to have furnished some offset to this solitary submission to a womanish vanity, they were fearfully fringed, from the garb knee to the bottom of the moccasin, with the hair of human scalps. He leaned lightly with one hand on a short hickory bow, while the other rather touched than sought support from the long, delicate handle of an ashen lance. A quiver made of the cougar's skin from which the tail of the animal depended as a characteristic ornament was slung at his back, and a shield of hides, quaintly emblazoned with another of his warlike deeds, was suspended from his neck by a thong of sinews. As the trapper approached, this warrior maintained his calm, upright attitude, discovering neither an eagerness to ascertain the character of those who advanced upon him, nor the smallest wish to avoid a scrutiny in his own person. An eye, that was darker and more shining than that of the stag, was incessantly glancing, however, from one to another of the stranger party, seemingly never knowing rest for an instant. "'Is my brother far from his village?' demanded the old man in the Pawnee language, after examining the paint, and those other little signs by which a practiced eye knows the tribe of the warrior he encounters in the American deserts, with the same readiness and by the same sort of mysterious observation as that by which the seaman knows the distant sail. "'It is farther to the towns of the Big Knives,' was the laconic reply. Why is a Pawnee loop so far from the fork of his own river, without a horse to journey on, and in a spot empty as this? Can the woman and children of a pale face live without the meat of the bison? There was hunger in my lodge. My brother is very young to be already the master of a lodge, returned the trapper, looking steadily into the unmoved countenance of the youthful warrior but I dare say he is brave, and that many of a chief has offered him his daughters for wives. But he has been mistaken, pointing to the arrow, which was dangling from the hand that held the bow, in bringing a loose and barbed arrowhead to kill the buffalo. Do the Pawnees wish the wounds they give their game to rankle? It is good to be ready for the Sioux, though not in sight a bush may hide him. The man is a living proof of the truth of his words muttered the trapper in English, and a close-jointed and gallant-looking lad he is, but far too young for a chief of any importance. It is wise, however, to speak him fair for a single arm thrown into either party, if we come to blows with the squatter and his brood, may turn the day. You see my children are weary, he continued in the dialect of the prairies, pointing as he spoke to the rest of the party, who by this time were also approaching. We wish to camp and eat. Does my brother claim this spot? The runners from the people on the big river tell us that your nation have traded with the tawny faces who live beyond the salt lake, and that the prairies are now the hunting grounds of the big knives. It is true, as I hear also from the hunters and the trappers on La Platte, though it is with the Frenchers, and not with the men who claim to own the Mexicos, that my people have bargained and warriors are going up the long river to see that they have not been cheated in what they have bought. Ay, that is partly true, too, I fear, and it will not be long before an accursed band of choppers and loggers will be following on their heels to humble the wilderness which lies so broad and rich on the western banks of the Mississippi, and then the land will be a peopled desert, from the shores of the main sea to the foot of the Rocky Mountains." filled with all the abominations and craft of man, and stripped of the comforts and loveliness it received from the hands of the Lord. And where were the chiefs of the Pawnee Loops when the bargain was made? Suddenly demanded the youthful warrior, a look of startling fierceness gleaming at the same instant, athwart his dark visage. Is a nation to be sold like the skin of a beaver? Right enough, right enough. 
and where were truth and honesty also. But might is right, according to the fashions of the earth, and what the strong choose to do, the weak must call justice. If the law of the Wakanda was as much hearkened to Pawnee as the laws of the Long Knives, your right to the prairies would be as good as that of the greatest chief in the settlements to the house which covers his head. The skin of the traveller is white, said the young native, laying a finger impressively on the hard and wrinkled hand of the trapper. Does his heart say one thing, and his tongue another? The Wakanda of a white man has ears, and he shuts them to a lie. Look at my head. It is like a frosted pine, and must soon be laid in the ground. Why then should I wish to meet the great spirit face to face, while his countenance is dark upon me? The Pawnee gracefully threw his shield over one shoulder, and placing a hand on his chest, he bent his head in deference to the gray locks exhibited by the trapper, after which his eye became more steady and his countenance less fierce. Still he maintained every appearance of a distrust and watchfulness that were rather tempered and subdued than forgotten. When this equivocal species of amity was established between the warrior of the prairies and the experienced old trapper, the latter proceeded to give his directions to Paul concerning the arrangements of the contemplated halt. While Inez and Ellen were dismounting, and Middleton and the bee-hunter were attending to their comforts, the discourse was continued, sometimes in the language of the natives, but often, as Paul and the doctor mingled their opinions with the two principal speakers, in the English tongue. There was a keen and subtle trial of skill between the Pawnee and the trapper, in which each endeavored to discover the objects of the other, without betraying his own interest in the investigation. As might be expected, when the struggle was between adversaries so equal, the result of the encounter answered the expectations of neither. The latter had put all the interrogatories his ingenuity and practice could suggest, concerning the state of the tribe of the Loops, their crops, their store of provisions for ensuing winter, and their relations with the different warlike neighbors without extorting any answer, which, in the slightest degree, elucidated the cause of his finding a solitary warrior so far from his people. On the other hand, while the questions of the Indian were far more dignified and delicate, they were equally ingenuous. He commented on the state of the trade in peltries, spoke of the good or ill success of many white hunters whom he had either encountered or heard named, and even alluded to the steady march which the nation of his great father, as he cautiously termed the government of the states, was making towards the hunting grounds of his tribe. It was apparent, however, by the singular mixture of interest, contempt, and indignation that were occasionally gleaming through the reserved manner of this warrior, that he knew the strange people who were thus trespassing on his native rights much more by report than by actual intercourse. This personal ignorance of the whites was as much betrayed by the manner in which he regarded the females as by the brief but energetic expressions which occasionally escaped him. While speaking to the trapper, he suffered his wandering glances to stray towards the intellectual and nearly infantile beauty of Inez, as one might be supposed to gaze upon the loveliness of an ethereal being. It was very evident that he now saw, for the first time, one of those females of whom the fathers of his tribe so often spoke, and who were considered of such rare excellence as to equal all that savage ingenuity could imagine in the way of loveliness. His observation of Ellen was less marked, but notwithstanding the warlike and chastened expression of his eye, there was much of the homage which man is made to pay to woman, even in the more cursory look he sometimes turned on her mature and perhaps more animated beauty. This admiration, however, was so tempered by his habits, and so smothered in the pride of a warrior, as completely to elude every eye but that of the trapper, who was too well skilled in Indian customs, and was too well instructed in the importance of rightly conceiving the character of the stranger, to let the smallest trait or the most trifling of his movements escape him. In the meantime, the unconscious Ellen herself moved about the feeble and less resolute Inez, with her accustomed assiduity 
and tenderness, exhibiting in her frank features those changing emotions of joy and regret which occasionally beset her, as her active mind dwelt on the decided step she had just taken, with the contending doubts and hopes, and possibly with some of the mental vacillation that was natural to her situation and sex. Not so Paul, conceiving himself to have obtained the two things dearest to his heart, the possession of Ellen, and a triumph over the sons of Ishmael, he now enacted his part in the business of the moment, with as much coolness as though he was already leading his willing bride from solemnizing their nuptials before a border magistrate to the security of his own dwelling. He had hovered around the moving family during the tedious period of their weary march, concealing himself by day, and seeking interviews with his betrothed as opportunities offered in the manner already described until fortune and his own intrepidity had united to render him successful, at the very moment when he was beginning to despair, and he now cared neither for distance, nor violence, nor hardships. To his sanguine fancy and determined resolution, all the rest was easily to be achieved. Such were his feelings, and such in truth they seemed to be. With his cap cast on one side, and whistling a low air, he thrashed among the bushes, in order to make a place suitable for the females to repose on, while, from time to time, he cast an approving glance at the agile form of Ellen, as she tripped past him, engaged in her own share of the duty. "'And so the wolf-tribe of the Pawnees have buried the hatchet with their neighbors, the Kanzas,' said the trapper, pursuing a discourse which he had scarcely permitted to flag, though it had been occasionally interrupted by the different directions with which he occasionally saw fit to interrupt it. The reader will remember that while he spoke to the native warrior in his own tongue, he necessarily addressed his white companions in English. "'The loops and the light-faced redskins are again friends. Doctor, this is a tribe of which all engage you have often read, and of which many a round lie has been whispered in the ears of the ignorant people who live in the settlements. There was a story of a nation of Welshers that lived here away in the prairies, and how they came into the land afore the easy-minded man who first led in the Christians to rob the heathens of their inheritance, had ever dreamt that the sun set on a country as big as that it rose from, and how they knew the white ways, and spoke with the white tongues, and a thousand other follies and idle conceits. "'Have I not heard of them?' exclaimed the naturalist, dropping a piece of jerked bison's meat, which he was rather roughly discussing at the moment. I should be greatly ignorant not to have often dwelt with delight on so beautiful a theory, and one which so triumphantly establishes two positions, which I have often maintained are unanswerable, even without such living testimony in their favor, viz., that this continent can claim a more remote affinity with civilization than the time of Columbus, and that color is the fruit of climate and condition, and not a regulation of nature." Propound the latter question to this Indian gentleman, venerable hunter. He is of a reddish tint himself, and his opinion may be said to make us masters of the two sides of the disputed point. Do you think a pawnee is a reader of books and a believer of printed lies like the eithers in the towns? retorted the old man, laughing. But it may be as well to humor the likings of the man, which, after all, it is quite possible are neither more nor less than his natural gift and therefore to be followed, although they may be pitied. What does my brother think? All whom he sees here have pale skins, but the Pawnee warriors are red. Does he believe that man changes with the season, and that the son is not like his father? The young warrior regarded his interrogator for a moment with a steady and deliberating eye. Then, raising his finger upward, he answered with dignity, The Wakanda pours the rain from his clouds, when he speaks, he shakes the lulls and the fire, which scorches the trees, is the anger of his eye. But he fashioned his children with care and thought. What he has thus made never alters. Aye, tis in the reason of nature that it should be so, doctor, continued the trapper, when he had interpreted this answer to the disappointed naturalist. The Pawnees are a wise and a great people and all engaged they abound in many a wholesome and honest tradition. The hunters and trappers that I sometimes see speak of a great warrior of your race. My tribe are not women. A brave is no stranger in my village. Ay, but he they speak of most is a chief far beyond the renown of common warriors, and one that might have done credit to that once mighty but now fallen people, the Delawares of the hills. 
Such a warrior should have a name. They call him Hardheart, from the stoutness of his resolution. And well is he named, if all I have heard of his deeds be true. The stranger cast a glance, which seemed to read the guileless soul of the old man, as he demanded, Has the pale-face seen the partisan of my people? Never. It is not with me now, as it used to be some forty years ago, when warfare and bloodshed were my calling and my gifts. A loud shout from the reckless Paul interrupted his speech, and at the next moment the bee-hunter appeared, leading an Indian war-horse from the side of the thicket opposite to the one occupied by the party. "'Here is a beast for a redskin to straddle!' he cried, as he made the animal go through some of its wild paces. "'There's not a brigadier in all Kentucky that can call himself master of so sleek and well-jointed a nag. A Spanish saddle, too, like a grandee of the Mexicos, and look at the mane and tail, braided and plaited down with little silver balls, as if it were Ellen herself getting her shining hair ready for a dance or a husking frolic. Isn't this a real trotter, old trapper, to eat out of the manger of a savage? Softly, lad, softly. The loops are famous for their horses, and it is often that you will see a warrior on the prairies far better mounted than the congressmen in the settlements. But this, indeed, is a beast that none but a powerful chief should ride. The saddle, as you rightly think, has been set upon in its day by a great Spanish captain, who has lost it in his life together, in some of the battles which this people often fight against the southern provinces. I warrant me, I warrant me, the youngster is the son of a great chief, maybe of the mighty Hardheart himself. During this rude interruption to the discourse, the young Pawnee manifested neither impatience nor displeasure but when he thought his beast had been the subject of sufficient comment, he very coolly, and with the air of one accustomed to have his will respected, relieved Paul of the bridle, and throwing the reins on the neck of the animal, he sprang upon his back with the activity of a professor of the equestrian art. Nothing could be finer or firmer than the seat of the savage. The highly wrought and cumbrous saddle was evidently more for show than use. Indeed, it impeded rather than aided the actions of limbs which disdain to seek assistance or admit of restraint from so womanish inventions as stirrups. The horse, which immediately began the prance, was, like its rider, wild and untutored in all his motions, but while there was so little of art, there was all the freedom and grace of nature in the movements of both. The animal was probably indebted to the blood of Araby for its excellence. Through a long pedigree that embraced the steed of Mexico, the Spanish barb, and the Moorish charger. The rider, in obtaining his steed from the provinces of Central America, had also obtained that spirit and grace in controlling him, which unite to form the most intrepid and perhaps the most skillful horseman in the world. Notwithstanding this sudden occupation of his animal, the Pawnee discovered no hasty wish to depart. More at his ease, and possibly more independent, now he found himself secure of the means of retreat, he rode back and forth, eyeing the different individuals of the party with a far greater freedom than before. But at each extremity of his ride, just as the sagacious trapper expected to see him profit by his advantage and fly, he would turn his horse, and pass over the same ground, sometimes with the rapidity of the flying deer, and at others more slowly, and with greater dignity of mien and attitude. Anxious to ascertain such facts as might have an influence on his future movements, the old man determined to invite him to a renewal of their conference. He therefore made a gesture expressive at the same time of his wish to resume the interrupted discourse, and of his own pacific attentions. The quick eye of the stranger was not slow to note the action, but it was not until a sufficient time had passed to allow him to debate the prudence of the measure in his own mind that he seemed willing to trust himself again so near a party that was so much superior to himself in physical power and consequently one that was able, at any instant, to command his life or control his personal liberty. When he did approach nigh enough to converse with facility, it was with a singular mixture of haughtiness and of distrust. "'It is far to the village of the Loops,' he said, stretching his arm in a direction contrary to that in which the trapper well knew the tribe dwelt. "'And the road is crooked. What has the big knife to say?' "'Ay, crooked enough.' muttered the old man in English, if you are set out on your journey by that path, but not half so whining as the cunning of an Indian's mind. Say, 
my brother, do the chiefs of the Pawnees love to see strange faces in their lodges? The young warrior bent his body gracefully, though but slightly, over the saddle bow, as he replied, When have my people forgotten to give food to the stranger? If I leave my daughters to the doors of the loops, will the women take them by the hand, and will the warriors smoke with my young men? The country of the pale faces is behind them. Why do they journey so far towards the setting sun? Have they lost the path, or are these the women of the white warriors that I hear are wading up the river of the troubled waters? Neither. They who wade the Missouri are the warriors of my great father, who has sent them on his message. But we are peace runners. The white men and the red are neighbors, and they wish to be friends. Do not the Omahas visit the loops, when the tomahawk is buried in the path between the two nations? The Omahas are welcome, and the Yanktons and the Burtwood Tetons, who live in the elbow of the river with muddy water, do they not come into the lodges of the loops and smoke? The Tetons are liars, exclaimed the other. They dare not shut their eyes in the night. No, they sleep in the sun, see? He added, pointing with fierce triumph to the frightful ornaments of his leggings. Their scalps are so plenty that the Pawnees tread on them. Go, let us Sioux live in the banks of snow. The plains and the buffaloes are for men. Ah, the secret is out, said the trapper to Middleton, who was an attentive but a deeply interested observer of what was passing. This good-looking young Indian is scouting on the track of the Sioux. You may see it by his arrowheads and his paint, ay, and by his eye, too. For a redskin lets his nature follow the business he is on, be it for peace or be it for war. Quiet, Hector, quiet. Have you never centered a Pawnee afore, pup? Keep down, dog, keep down. My brother is right. The Sioux are thieves. Men of all colors and nations say it of them, and say it truly. But the people from the rising sun are not Sioux, and they wish to visit the lodges of the Loops. The head of my brother is white, returned the Pawnee, throwing one of those glances at the trapper, which were so remarkably expressive of distrust, intelligence, and pride, and then pointing, as he continued, towards the eastern horizon. And his eyes have looked on many things. Can he tell me the name of what he sees yonder? Is it a buffalo? It looks more like a cloud peeping above the skirt of the plain with the sunshine lighting its edges. It is the smoke of the heavens. It is a hill of the earth, and on its top are the lodges of pale faces. Let the woman of my brother wash their feet among the people of their own color. The eyes of the Pawnee are good, if he can see a white skin so far. The Indian turned slowly towards the speaker, and after a pause of a moment he sternly demanded, Can my brother hunt? Alas, I claim to be no better than a miserable trapper. When the plain is covered with the buffaloes, can he see them? No doubt, no doubt, it is far easier to see than to take a scampering bull. And when the birds are flying from the cold, and the clouds are black with their feathers, can he see them too? Ay, ay, it is not hard to find a duck or a goose when millions are darkening the heavens. When the snow falls and covers the lodges of the long knives, can the stranger see flakes in the air? My eyes are none of the best now, returned the old man, a little resentfully. But the time has been when I had a name for my sight. The redskins find the big knives as easily as strangers see the buffalo, or the traveling birds, or the falling snow. Your warriors think the master of life has made the whole earth white. They are mistaken, they are pale, and it is their own faces they see. Go, a Pawnee is not blind, that he need look long for your people. The warrior suddenly paused, and bent his face aside, like one who listened with all his faculties absorbed in the act. Then, turning the head of his horse, he rode to the nearest angle of the thicket, and looked intently across the bleak prairie, in a direction opposite to the side on which the party stood. Returning slowly from this unaccountable and to his observer's startling procedure, he riveted his eyes on Inez, and paced back and forth several times, with the air of one who maintained a warm struggle on some difficult point, in the recesses of his own thoughts. He had drawn the reins of his impatient steed, and was seemingly about to speak, when his head again sunk on his chest, and he resumed his former attitude of attention. 
galloping like a deer to the place of his former observations he rode for a moment swiftly in short and rapid circles as if still uncertain of his course and then darted away like a bird that has been fluttering around its nest before it takes a distant flight after scouring the plain for a minute he was lost to the eye behind a swell of the land the hounds who had also manifested great uneasiness for some time followed him for a little distance and then terminated their chase by seating themselves on the ground and raising their usual low whining and warning howls End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. How if he will not stand? Shakespeare. The several movements related in the close of the preceding chapter had passed in so short a space of time that the old man, while he neglected not to note the smallest incident, had no opportunity of expressing his opinion concerning the stranger's motives. After the pawnee had disappeared, however, he shook his head and muttered, while he walked slowly to the angle of the thicket that the Indian had just quitted. There are both scents and sounds in the air, though my miserable senses are not good enough to hear the one or to catch the taint of the other. There is nothing to be seen cried Middleton, who kept close at his side. My eyes and my ears are good, and yet I can assure you that I neither hear nor see anything. Your eyes are good, and you are not deaf, returned the other with a slight air of contempt. No, lad, no. They may be good to see across a church or to hear a town bell, but afore you had passed a year in these prairies, you would find yourself taking a turkey for a buffalo, or conceding fifty times that the roar of a buffalo bull was the thunder of the Lord. There is a deception of nature in these naked plains in which the air throws up the images like water, and then it is hard to tell the prairies from a sea. But yonder is a sign that a hunter never fails to know. The trapper pointed to a flight of vultures that were sailing over the plain at no great distance, and apparently in the direction in which the Pawnee had riveted his eye. At first Middleton could not distinguish the small dark objects that were dotting the dusky clouds, but as they came swiftly onward, first their forms, and then their heavy waving wings, became distinctly visible. Listen, said the trapper, when he had succeeded in making Middleton see the moving column of birds. Now you hear the buffaloes or bisons as your knowing doctor sees fit to call them though buffaloes is their name among the hunters of these regions, and I conclude that a hunter is a better judge of a beast and of its name, he added, winking to the young soldier, than any man who has turned over the leaves of a book, instead of traveling over the face of the earth, in order to find out the nature of its inhabitants. Of their habits I will grant you, cried the naturalist, who rarely missed an opportunity to agitate any disputed point in his favorite studies. That is, provided always, deference is had to the proper use of definitions, and that they are contemplated with scientific eyes. Eyes of a mole! As if man's eyes were not as good for names as the eyes of any other creature. Who named the works of his hand? Can you tell me that, with your books and college wisdom? Was it not the first man in the garden? And is it not a plain consequence that his children inherit his gifts? That is certainly the mosaic account of the event said the doctor, though your reading is by far too literal. My reading? Nay, if you suppose that I have wasted my time in schools, you do such a wrong to my knowledge as one mortal should never lay to the door of another without sufficient reason. If I have ever craved the art of reading, it has been that I might better know the sayings of the book you name, for it is a book which speaks in every line according to human feelings, and therein according to reason." "'And do you then believe,' said the doctor, a little provoked by the dogmatism of his stubborn adversary, and perhaps secretly too confident in his own more liberal, though scarcely as profitable, attainments, "'do you then believe that all these beasts were literally collected in a garden, to be enrolled in the nomenclature of the first man?' "'Why not? I understand your meaning, for it is not needful to live in towns to hear all the devilish devices that the conceit a man can invent to upset his own happiness.' What does it prove, 
except indeed it may be said to prove that the garden he made was not after the miserable fashions of our times, thereby directly giving the lie to what the world calls its civilizing. No, no, the garden of the Lord was the forest then, and is the forest now, where the fruits do grow, and the birds do sing, according to his own wise ordering. Now, lady, you may see the mystery of the vultures. There come the buffaloes themselves, and a noble herd it is. I warrant me that Pawnee has a troop of his people in some of the hollows nigh by, and as he has gone scampering after them, you are about to see glorious chase. It will serve to keep the squatter and his brood under cover, and for ourselves there is little reason to fear. A Pawnee is not apt to be a malicious savage. Every eye was now drawn to the striking spectacle that succeeded. Even the timid Inez hastened to the side of the Middleton to gaze at the sight and Paul summoned Ellen from her culinary labors to become a witness of the lively scene. Throughout the whole of those moving events, which it has been our duty to record, the prairies had lain in the majesty of perfect solitude. The heavens had been blackened with the passage of the migratory birds, it is true, but the dogs of the party and the ass of the doctor were the only quadrupeds that had enlivened the broad surface of the waste beneath. There was now a sudden exhibition of animal life, which changed the scene, as it were by magic, to the very opposite extreme. A few enormous bison bulls were first observed, scouring along the most distant roll of the prairie, and then succeeded long files of single beasts, which, in their turns, were followed by a dark mass of bodies, until the dun-colored herbage of the plain was entirely lost, in the deeper hue of their shaggy coats. The herd, as the column spread and thickened, was like the endless flocks of the smaller birds, who extended flanks, beep, whose extended flanks are so often seen to heave up out of the abyss of the heavens until they appear as countless as the leaves in those forests over which they wing their endless flight. Clouds of dust shot up in little columns from the center of the mass as some animal, more furious than the rest, ploughed the plain with his horns, and from time to time a deep hollow bellowing was borne along on the wind, as if a thousand throats vented their plaints in a discordant murmuring. A long amusing silence reigned in the party, as they gazed on this spectacle of wild and peculiar grandeur. It was at length broken by the trapper, who, having been long accustomed to similar sights, felt less of its influence, or rather, felt it in a less thrilling and absorbing manner than those to whom the scene was more novel. There go ten thousand oxen in one drove, without keeper or master, except him who made them, and gave them these open plains for their pasture. Ay, it is here that man may see the proofs of his wantonness and folly. Can the proudest governor in all the states go into his fields, and slaughter a nobler bullock that is here offered to the meanest hand? and when he has gotten his sirloin or his steak, can he eat it with as good a relish as he who has sweetened his food with wholesome toil, and earned it according to the law of nature, by honestly mastering that which the Lord hath put before him? If the plary platter is smoking with a buffalo's hump, I answer, no, interrupted the luxurious bee-hunter. Ay, boy, you have tasted, and you feel the genuine reasoning of the thing. But the herd is heading a little this away, and it behooves us to make ready for their visit. If we hide ourselves altogether, the horned brutes will break through the place and trample us beneath their feet like so many creeping worms. So we will just put the weak ones apart and take post, as becomes men and hunters in the van. As there was but little time to make the necessary arrangements, the whole party set about them in good earnest. Inez and Ellen were placed in the edge of the thicket, on the side farthest from the approaching herd. Asenus was posted in the center, in consideration of his nerves, and then the old man, with his three male companions, divided themselves in such a manner as they thought would enable them to turn the head of the rushing column, should it chance to approach too nigh their position. By the vacillating movements of some fifty or a hundred bulls that led the advance, it remained questionable for many moments what course they intended to pursue. But a tremendous and painful roar, which came from behind the cloud of dust that rose in the center of the herd, and which was hardly answered by the screams of the carrion birds that were greedily sailing directly above the flying drove, appeared to give a new impulse to their flight, and at once to remove every symptom of indecision. As if glad to seek the smallest signs of the forest, 
the whole of the affrighted herd became steady in its direction, rushing in a straight line toward the little cover of bushes which has already been so often named. The appearance of danger was now, in reality, of a character to try the stoutest nerves. The flanks of the dark, moving mass were advanced in such manner as to make a concave line of the front, and every fierce eye that was glaring from the shaggy wilderness of hair in which the entire heads of the males were enveloped was riveted with mad anxiety on the thicket. It seemed as if each beast strove to outstrip his neighbor in gaining this desired cover and as thousands in the rear pressed blindly on those in front, there was the appearance of an imminent risk that the leaders of the herd would be precipitated on the concealed party, in which case the destruction of every one of them was certain. Each of our adventurers felt the danger of his situation in a manner peculiar to his individual character and circumstances. Middleton wavered. At times he felt inclined to rush through the bushes, and, seizing Inez, attempt to fly. Then, recollecting the impossibility of outstripping the furious speed of an alarmed bison, he felt for his arms, determined to make head against the countless drove. The faculties of Dr. Battius were quickly wrought up to be very summit of mental delusion. The dark forms of the herd lost their distinctness, and then the naturalist began to fancy he beheld a wild collection of all the creatures of the world, rushing upon him in a body, as if to revenge the various injuries which in the course of a life of indefatigable labor in behalf of the natural sciences he had inflicted on their several genera. The paralysis it occasioned in his system was like the effect of the incubus. Equally unable to fly or to advance, he stood riveted to the spot until the infatuation became so complete that the worthy naturalist was beginning, by a desperate effort of scientific resolution, even to class the different specimens. On the other hand, Paul shouted, and called on Ellen to come and assist him in shouting, but his voice was lost in the bellowings and trampling of the herd. Furious, and yet strangely excited by the obstinacy of the brutes and the wildness of the sight, and nearly maddened by sympathy and a species of unconscious apprehension, in which the claims of nature were singularly mingled with concern for his mistress, he nearly split his throat in exhorting his aged friend to interfere. "'Come forth, old trapper!' he shouted. "'With your prairie inventions, or we shall be all smothered under a mountain of buffalo humps!' The old man, who had stood all this while leaning on his rifle, and regarding the movements of the herd with a steady eye, now deemed it time to strike his blow. Leveling his piece at the foremost bull, with an agility that would have done credit to his youth, he fired. The animal received the bullet on the matted hair between his horns, and fell to his knees. But shaking his head, he instantly arose, the very shock seeming to increase his exertions. There was now no longer time to hesitate. Throwing down his rifle, the trapper stretched forth his arms and advanced from the cover with naked hands directly towards the rushing column of the beast. The figure of a man, when sustained by the firmness and steadiness that intellect can only impart, rarely fails of commanding respect from all the inferior animals of the creation. The leading bulls recoiled, and for a single instant there was a sudden stop to their speed, a dense mass of bodies rolling up in front, until hundreds were seen floundering and tumbling on the plain. Then came another of those hollow bellowings from the rear, and set the herd again in motion. The head of the calm, however, divided. The immovable form of the trapper, cutting it, as it were, into two gliding streams of life. Middleton and Paul instantly profited by his example, and extended the feeble barrier by similar exhibition of their own persons. For a few moments the new impulse given to the animals in front served to protect the thicket, but as the body of the herd pressed more and more upon the open line of its defenders, and the dust thickened so as to obscure their persons, there was at each instant a renewed danger of the beast breaking through it became necessary for the trapper and his companions to become still more and more alert, and they were gradually yielding before the headlong multitude when a furious bull darted by Middleton so near as to brush his person and at the next instant swept through the thicket with the velocity of the wind. "'Close and die for the ground!' shouted the old man, "'or a thousand of the devils will be at his heels!' All their efforts would have proved fruitless, however, against the living torrent, had not Asinus, whose domains had been so rudely entered, lifted his voice in the midst of the uproar. 
the most sturdy and furious of the bulls trembled at the alarming and unknown cry, and then each individual brute was seen madly pressing from the very thicket, which, the moment before, he had endeavored to reach, with the eagerness with which the murderer seeks the sanctuary. As the stream divided, the place became clearer, the two dark columns moving obliquely from the copse to unite again at the distance of a mile on its opposite side. The instant the old man saw the sudden effect which the voice of Asinus had produced, he coolly commenced reloading his rifle, indulging at the same time in a heartfelt fit of his silent and peculiar merriment. There they go, like dogs, with so many half-filled shot pouches, dangling at their tails, and no fear of their breaking their order. For what the brutes in the rear didn't hear, with their own ears, though conceit they did, besides, if they changed their minds, it may be no hard matter to get the jack to sing the rest of his tune. "'The ass has spoken, but Balaam is silent,' cried the bee-hunter, catching his breath after a repeated burst of noisy mirth, that might possibly have added to the panic of the buffaloes by its vociferation. "'The man is as completely dumbfounded as if a swarm of young bees had settled on the end of his tongue.' and he's not willing to speak for fear of their answer. "'How now, friend?' continued the trapper, addressing the still motionless and entranced naturalist. "'How now, friend? Are you who make your livelihood by booking the names and natures of the beasts of the fields and the fowls of the air, frightened at a herd of scampering buffaloes? Though perhaps you are ready to dispute my right to call them by a word that is in the mouth of every hunter and trader on the frontier?' The old man was, however, mistaken in supposing he could excite the benumbed faculties of the doctor by provoking a discussion. From that time henceforth he was never known, except on one occasion, to utter a word that indicated either the species or the genus of the animal. He obstinately refused the nutritious food of the whole ox family, and even to the present hour, now that he is established in all the scientific dignity and security of a savant in one of the maritime towns, he turns his back with a shudder on those delicious and unrivaled viands that are so often seen at the suppers of the craft, and which are unequaled by anything that is served under the same name at the boasted chop-houses of London or at the most renowned of the Parisian restaurants. In short, the distaste of the worthy naturalist for beef was not unlike that which the shepherd sometimes produces by first muzzling and fettering his delinquent dog and then leaving him as a stepping-stone for the whole flock to use in its transit over a wall, or through the opening of a sheepfold, a process which is said to produce in the culprit a species of surfeit on the subject of mutton, for ever after. By the time Paul and the trapper saw fit to terminate the fresh bursts of merriment, which the continued abstraction of their learned companion did not fail to excite, he commenced breathing again, as if the suspended action of his lungs had been renewed by the application of a pair of artificial bellows, and was heard to make use of the ever afterwards prescribed term on that solitary occasion to which we have just alluded. "'Boves Americani Haridi!' exclaimed the doctor, laying great stress on the latter word, after which he continued mute, like one who pondered on strange and unaccountable events. "'Ay, horrid eyes enough, I will willingly allow.' returned the trapper, and altogether the creature has a frightful look to one unused to the sights and bustle of a natural life. But then the courage of the beast is in no way equal to its countenance. Lord, man, if you should ever once get fairly beset by a brood of grizzly bears, as happened to Hector and I at the great falls of the mist, ah, here comes the tail of the herd, and yonder goes a pack of hungry wolves ready to pick up the sick, or such as get a disjointed neck by a tumble. Ha! There are mounted men on their trail, or I'm no sinner. Here, lad, you may see them here away, just where the dust is scattering afore the wind. They are hovering around a wounded buffalo, making an end of the surly devil with their arrows. Middleton and Paul soon caught a glimpse of the dark group that the quick eye of the old man had so readily detected. Some fifteen or twenty horsemen were, in truth, to be seen riding in quick circuits about a noble bull which stood at bay, too grievously hurt to fly, and yet seeming to disdain to fall, notwithstanding his hard body had already been the target for a hundred arrows. A thrust from the lance of a powerful Indian, however, completed his conquest, and the brute gave up his obstinate hold of life with a roar, that passed bellowing over the place where our adventurers stood, and reaching the ears of the affrighted herd, added a new impulse to their flight. 
"'How well the Pawnee knew the philosophy of a buffalo hunt,' said the old man, after he had stood regarding the animated scene for a few moments, with evident satisfaction. "'You saw how he went off like the wind before the drove. It was in order that he might not taint the air, and that he might turn the flank and join. Ha! How is this? Yonder redskins are no Pawnees. The feathers in their heads are from the wings and tails of owls. Ah! As I am but miserable, half-sighted trapper, it is a band of the accursed Sioux. To cover, lads, to cover. A single cast of an eye this away would strip us of every rag of clothes, as surely as the lightning scorches the bush, and it might be that our very lives would be far from safe. Middleton had already turned from the spectacle to seek that which pleased him better, the sight of his young and beautiful bride. Paul seized the doctor by the arm, and as the trapper followed with the smallest possible delay, the whole party was quickly collected within the cover of the thicket. After a few short explanations concerning the character of this new danger, the old man, on whom the whole duty of directing their movements was devolved, in deference to his great experience, continued his discourse as follows. This is a region, as you must all know, where a strong arm is far better than the right, and where the white law is as little known as needed. Therefore does everything now depend on judgment and power. If, he continued, laying his finger on his cheek, like one who considered deeply all sides of the embarrassing situation in which he found himself, if an invention could be framed which would set these Sioux and the brood of the squatter by the ears, then might we come in, like the buzzards after a fight atween the beasts, and pick up the gleanings on the ground. There are Pawnees nigh us, too. It is a certain matter— for yonder lad is not so far from his village without an errand. Here are, therefore, four parties within the sound of a cannon, not one of whom can trust the other, all which makes movement a little difficult in a district where covers are far from plenty, but we are three well-armed, and I think I may see three stout-hearted men. Four, interrupted Paul. Anon, said the old man, looking up simply at his companion. Four! repeated the bee-hunter, pointing to the naturalist. "'Every army has its hangers-on and idlers,' rejoined the blunt border man. "'Friend, it will be necessary to slaughter this ass.' "'To slay a sinus? Such a deed would be an act of supererogatory cruelty.' "'I know nothing of your words which hide their meaning and sound, but that is cruel which sacrifices a Christian to a brute. This is what I call the reason of mercy.' It would be just as safe to blow a trumpet as to let the animal raise his voice again, inasmuch as it would prove a manifest challenge to the Sioux. I will answer for the discretion of a sinus who seldom speaks without a reason. They say a man can be known by the company he keeps, retorted the old man. And why not a brute? I once made a force march, and went through a great deal of jeopardy with a companion who never opened his mouth but to sing, and trouble enough and great concern of mine did the fellow give me. It was in that very business with your grandfather, Captain. But then he had a human throat, and well did he know how to use it. On occasion, though, he didn't always stop to regard the time and seasons fit for such outcries. Ah's me, if I was now as I was then, it wouldn't be a band of thieving Sioux that should easily drive me from such a lodgment as this. But what signifies boasting when sight and strength are both failing? The warrior that the Delawares once saw fit to call after the hawk, for the goodness of his eyes, would now be better turned the mole. In my judgment, therefore, it will be well to slay the brute. "'There's argument and good logic in it,' said Paul. "'Music is music, and it is always noisy, whether it comes from a fiddle or a jackass. Therefore I agree with the old man and say, kill the beast.' "'Friends,' said the naturalist, looking with a sorrowful eye from one to another of his bloodily disposed companions, "'Slay not his sinners. He is a specimen of his kind, of whom much good and little evil can be said, hardy and docile for his genus, abstemious and patient, even for his humble species. We have journeyed much together, and his death would grieve me. How would it trouble thy spirit, venerable venerator, to separate in such an untimely manner from your faithful hound? The animal shall not die, said the old man, suddenly clearing his throat, in a manner that proved he felt the force of the appeal but his voice must be smothered. Bind his jaws with the halter, and then I think we may trust the rest of Providence. With this double security for the discretion of Asinus, for Paul instantly bound the muzzle of the ass in the manner required, the trapper seemed content. 
after which he proceeded to the margin of the thicket to reconnoiter. The uproar which attended the passage of the herd was now gone, or rather it was heard rolling along the prairie at the distance of a mile. The clouds of dust were already blown away by the wind, and a clear range was left to the eye in that place where ten minutes before there existed a scene of so much wildness and confusion. The Sioux had completed their conquests, and apparently satisfied with this addition to the numerous previous captures they had made, they now seemed content to let the remainder of the herd escape. A dozen remained around the carcass, over which a few buzzards were balancing themselves with steady wings and greedy eyes, while the rest were riding about in quest of such further booty as might come in their way on the trail of so vast a drove. The trapper measured the proportions and scanned the equipments of such individuals as drew nearer to the side of the thicket with careful eyes. At length he pointed out one among them to Middleton as Wooka. Now know we not only who they are, but their errand, the old man continued, deliberately shaking his head. They have lost the trail of the squatter and are on its hunt. These buffaloes have crossed their path, and in chasing the animals, bad luck has led them in open sight of the hill on which the brood of Ishmael have harbored. Do you see yon birds watching for the offals of the beast they have killed? Therein is a moral which teaches the manner of a prairie life. A band of Pawnees are outlying for these very Sioux, as you see the buzzards looking down for their food, and it behooves us, as Christian men who have so much at stake, to look down upon them both. Ha! What brings yonder two skirting reptiles to a stand? As you live, they have found the place where the miserable son of the squatter met his death. The old man was not mistaken. Wooka and a savage who accompanied him had reached that spot which has already been mentioned as furnishing the frightful evidences of violence and bloodshed. There they sat on their horses, examining the well-known signs with the intelligence that distinguishes the habits of the Indians. Their scrutiny was long, and apparently not without distrust. At length they raised a cry that was scarcely less piteous and startling than that which the hounds had before made over the same fatal signs, and which did not fail to draw the whole band immediately around them, as the fell bark of the jackal is said to gather his comrades to the chase. End of chapter 19